We've got so much to cover today. So I, I need to finish off this chapter. So let's just get, uh, get, get let's just make a start. Um, page five point six. I started, I started talking about turbines uh, last uh, on Monday, and uh, in our last lecture, this is the part which I said we're going to be really looking at some applications. We're going to be starting with some what we call adiabatic machines. These are some of the sort of machines that you've 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 seen or you've heard before, and we're going to be looking at the application of the energy. Uh, steady uh, energy equation, the steady flow energy equation uh, in these machines. Now I'm going to start with the compressor. The first thing I want to say is compressors are what we call, uh, these are power consuming machines. Now that's, it makes a difference because when it comes to our convention, when it comes to finding out whether the work is positive or negative, in the, in, the, in the case of compressors, that's actually negative. And I want you to think about this because compressors, essentially you have to provide some work to the compressor in order to, for the compressor to compress air or whatever you're compressing, gas. So they are power consuming machines. Uh, and and uh, when you get to turbines, that's exactly the opposite because turbines are the ones that will provide some work, will produce some work, therefore the work will be positive. This is the, uh, the symbol or the configuration or the schematic how we show compressors. You've got this sort of a large area going to this smaller area. That's how we show it. And it sort of makes sense because you try to compress uh, the gas uh, that you, you want to compress in this situation. Um, the other thing to note is that we use subscript S because its shaft is a typical example of a shaft work. Therefore, it's WS. That's, that's what we deal with. And from last session, you remember that this is the equation that we, we said is the steady flow energy equation. The sort of terms that we got rid of are the, um, uh, essentially the term which would take into account the time. If I want to show you what we had in, uh, from last week, quickly, it's this term that is actually that doesn't exist in, in, in this case, which is the energy equation for the whole CV. Uh, and if that is zero, then you're going to end up with the steady flow energy equation. Now, starting with that, when it comes to comp compressors, surprisingly, a lot of these terms actually would disappear because we're going to make a lot of assumptions. Some common assumptions, the kinetic energy, or the half delta V squared, it's going to be a lot less than, than the change in enthalpy. Also, the change in the potential energy, which comes from the change in elevation because of delta Z, is going to be quite smaller than it's, very, it's going to be you know, very small compared to delta H again. As a result of that, you can't get rid of these two terms. We're not saying they're zero, but we're just saying that because if you've got 1,000 plus 0.1, then surely that 0.1 is not zero, but still it's not significant compared to 1,000. And therefore, you can assume that that is not, you, you don't have to include that in the equation. And that's what we're doing here. The other thing is that we're going to assume that this is an adiabatic machine. And that, that's the first assumption that I said. These are adiabatic machines, compressors. Uh, and therefore, Q is going to be zero. What you're left with? What you're left with is this equation, this very simple equation. And it shows the importance of enthalpy. Uh, I told you enthalpy has some very important meaning and application in, in turbine machinery, especially because whenever you have gases, enthalpy makes a, uh, you know, it plays a, a very important role. And in this case, actually, you can see out of all these properties that we've introduced so far, enthalpy is the one that is left. Uh, on the left-hand side of this equ equation, and that is actually what leads to the amount of work that you get out of your compressor. Something to note is that this equation is when you have a vapor. And what I mean by a vapor, it means that this is a pure substance. If you have a pure substance, uh, therefore, that, you know, in that case, actually, this is the equation that you have to be using. So if you've got, for example, steam, uh, if you've got R12, if you've got ammonia, 
the sort of things that we discussed as, as pure substances, um, pure substances, that's the equation that you use. And as a result, you have to use steam tables for that. And hopefully by now, you know how to use the steam tables and you can find the, the entropy for each uh, case. The important issue is that if you are dealing with non-pure uh, substances, for, for example, with ideal gases, that is the equation to use. And what I mean by ideal gases, for example, if you've got air, if you've got CO2, if you've got, I don't know, other, other type of gases, which are not part of the, you know, which do not meet the criteria for a pure, pure substance, then this is the equation. And you can see from this equation that you are now using, not using the entropy, instead you're using what we defined earlier to be equivalent to entropy, uh, and that is, so remember CP was dH by dt, that's where we get this from. So by rearranging that, we get H1 minus H2 equals CP dT T1 minus T2, and we're just going to replace this with CP delta T, and that's the equation that you would use in ideal gases. We'll come back to ideal gases later on uh, in, um, in, I think, chapter uh, six or seven, but for now, just bear in mind that it really, it varies. The sort of, the way that you analyze uh, the flow in compressors, and in fact, in, in turbines and other machines, it makes a difference whether it's, um, it's pure substance or it's actually a, a gas, ideal gas. Um, something about the signage of, of the work, again, uh, the fact that in a compressor, T2 is always bigger than T1, which means the air or the, the flow which is coming out of the compressor is going to be at a higher temperature than the inlet, and it makes sense because you're compressing it, and therefore temperature goes up. And by putting that, those numbers in this equation, because this is bigger than this, surely this is going to be a negative value, and your work is going to be negative, which proves that compressor is a power consumer uh, when it comes to um, the convention. Not only the convention, even the physics and the, the way it actually works, it is a power con consumer. Okay. Pumps. The second machine I want to talk about, not much, because in the context of thermodynamics, pumps, yes, we use them, uh, but probably not as often as uh, uh, compressors. Um, as I mentioned, the only main difference between pumps uh, and compressors is that compressors are, are used for liquids, whereas compressors are, are used for, for gases. But they, essentially, they do the same thing. They, they increase the pressure of your, of your fluid. Um, in terms of the steady flow energy equation, now that is the equation that we defined for the compressor, and of course we start with that, but we are more interested to expand the equation for H. Remember H was a definition, and that was U plus PV, and I'm going to expand that definition here in terms of you know state two and state one, which represents inlet and outlet. And if you do that, then I can write it in this form. And because in pumps, there's not going to be huge amounts of um, change in temperature, because pump is not going to really increase the um, uh, temperature of the fluid. Therefore, the, the change in the internal energy, in the intrinsic internal energy, is not going to be significant. So that could potentially be ignored. And because the flow, or liquids actually in this case, liquids are not very compressible. The, the compress compressibility of, of, of a fluid, of a liquid, is actually very little. As I mentioned about hydraulic systems, oil and, and water, they're not easy to compress. Uh, as a result of that, the uh, change in a specific uh, volume also is going to be very little. Therefore, V1 is going to be equal to V2. You can take that out of the bracket, and then you're going to be left with V times P2 minus P1. So the message here really is that when it comes to a pump, the equation that you'll be using will be 
specific volume times the pressure difference between inlet and outlet. Again, we'll come back to the, to the pumps. I think the, the, the best example in thermodynamic cycles uh, when we use pumps is when it comes to, um, never mind, I, I, if, I, if, if I start talking about that, then I, uh, you know, I need to go into lots of details, but some cycles um, you have a compressor and sometimes you, you, can, you can replace a compressor with a pump uh, if the, the, the fluid in that cycle is actually liquid. And as you know, we don't have a lot of cycles which involve liquid, they're mainly gases, and therefore that's why you know, it has limited um, applications. However, because it has some similarity to a compressor, I think it's worth including in, at this point. Let's now do one example on the compressor and see if um, we can use uh, the steam table in order to find uh, the answer. So we've got a refrigerator compressor uh, to compress R12 at a mass flow rate of 5 kilogram. So that is M dot. With a pressure change from 1.004 bar to 27.89. So the pressure goes up. And this is P1. This is P2. We want to find the adiabatic power required by the machine. And we're going to assume that the condition of the gas is dry saturated. This is important. Uh, and remember the sort of the PV diagram or TS diagram, whatever you want to call it. When it says this is dry saturated, it means we are working on that curve, somewhere on this curve, with a subscript G. So whatever that is, um, you know, we're going to have, for example, HG because it's saturated, it's dry, uh, and therefore, in the, in the context of the value of x, the dryness fraction, x equals 1. That's what it implies. You can, neglect the, you can neglect the changes in potential and kinetic energy. By taking those assumptions, we know that we're going to be using this equation. That's the equation that we use. Why do we not use the CP delta T? Well, because you've got R12, and it's a pure substance. It's not an ideal gases. Uh, therefore, um, you would use steam tables, and therefore, you would use um, this equation. Now, in this diagram, we've got the information. We know P1. We know P2. We know the mass flow rate. And what seems to be missing is only H1 and H2. In order to find those, then, of course, you've, you've got to go to the steam table where we have R12. And uh, I think if you want to look at where we got these numbers from, if you go to page 14 in your steam table, that's where we have R12. And you've got to look at the pressure. So if I show you the pressure here, 1.004 at that pressure, and what I'm looking for is the value of Hg which is 174.20. That's where I got this, this number from. The other one is the pressure is actually 27.89, which is towards the bottom. And again, the sort of pressure that you would, the, the sort of value that you're after is Hg, and that is 212.80. And these are the two, the two values that uh, we're going to be using in our, in our example. So, page 14 from the steam table, and very easily we got the numbers. What you have to remember is that, in this case, we didn't have to do any interpolation. We were lucky because the actual value of pressure was in the table. In some situations, that may not be the case, which means you have to do interpolation. But you know, hopefully by now, you know how to do interpolation, linear interpolation, so that shouldn't be a, a, a problem. Um, and once you put the values of H in, in there, you can then work out what is the value of W, S, and it works out as minus 193 kilowatts. Pay attention to the minus sign and pay attention to the units. Because it's W dot, the units for that would be watts. And 
And again, the fact that it's negative just emphasizes that the work is done on the system. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay. We are now going to the third machine, which is a turbine. Now, turbine is probably one of the biggest inventions in, um, in thermodynamic systems and cycles. It's, despite its simple design, it's fascinating, the sort of things that it does. Um, it's so powerful, it's used in a lot of cycles. It, it, it's responsible for producing the power, uh, and it's actually a power producing uh, machine, because as we'll see, the work is actually positive in turbines. If you want to understand why turbine is a power producing uh, and compressor is a power consuming machine, then think about a uh, typical jet engine. You've got the jet engine, you've got the compressor in, in front, you've got this uh, sort of essentially um, uh, an axis which connects the, uh, the, the compressor to the turbine, and you've got the turbine towards the end of the jet engine. What powers the compressor is a turbine, and what powers the turbine is essentially the, the heat which comes from the combustion chamber. It rotates the, the, the blades of the propellers within the turbine, and because the turbine would rotate, it would actually rotate the compressor as well. Uh, the whole reason why you have the turbine is actually to be able to power the compressor. Now, looking at the um, steady flow energy equation, the same assumptions that we saw for compressors we saw here as well. So the kinet kinetic energy and the potential energy are not zero, but they're actually quite small compared to the change of entropy. And therefore, they can be ignored in that equation. We're going to assume that there's not going to be uh, a lot of heat uh, involved or the change of heat. And therefore, um, Q is going to be zero. Now, I've put just a line here to indicate why you can assume that Q is actually set to zero. Now, I think for the compressor, maybe it makes more sense, but for the turbine, we know the turbines operate at very high temperature normally, and if I told you that this is a turbine, and I asked you to, to, to touch the turbine with your hands, you probably wouldn't touch it, because you would think, well, actually, it's rotating at a very high rate, it's, um, you know, it's, it's dealing with, with, with high pressure, it's going to be probably hot, uh, and, you, you're hot and you know, it's a lot of situations you're right. Um, so you might think, but then what's the assumption of Q equals zero? If certainly I can see that there is heat coming from this uh, turbine, how can I assume that this is, a, this is a, an adiabatic machine? Now, the adiabatic feature of the compressor and turbines and some of these machines, first of all, is, is, a, uh, is an assumption. It's not 100% true. We do not have a perfect adiabatic machine, really, in reality. Um, but the fact that it's actually it's a valid assumption is because Yes, the casing of the turbine, which surrounds the, uh, the, com the, the turbine blades, is going to be quite hot, but the actual leakage from the casing is going to be little in, in, our, in our assumption. And therefore, the amount of heat flux coming out of the whole system and outside the casing of, of, of the turbine, because it's, it's minimal, therefore you can assume that Q equals zero is a good approximation in this case. So the only difference here that you saw compared to the compressor is just the sign um, that, you, that you had in the compressor. In the compressor, we had WS was equal to H2 minus H1. In this case, we have the opposite just because of the sign. And very similarly, that's only when you have pure substances. If you have ideal gases or perfect gases, then that's the sort of equation that you would be using for the turbine. Again, pay attention to that sign uh, convention. And if you think about the actual temperature, in a gas turbine, uh, because you, you've got, an, essentially the, the, the gas would lose its energy as it goes through the, uh, the turbine, you would expect that the temperature at the outlet would be less. 
so they, the flow would lose some energy and would lose some heat. As a result, temperature 2 will be less than T1, and therefore the right-hand side of the equation will be always positive, which again proves that turbine is a power-producing machine. Let's now do one example on the turbine. So we've got a steam turbine, and it's supplied with superheat steam. Now, when it comes to the superheated steam, that is um, this part of the graph, the PV diagram, if you like. On the right-hand side of the saturated line, that area is the superheated region. We're going to be doing more examples on the superheated region, uh, but I think the, this might be the first one that we're going to be using. Uh, and that's, you're going to be going to uh, page eight of the steam table where it actually deals with the superheated um, steam. But any, anyway, so we've got superheated steam at 100 bar and uh, 600 Celsius. This is our P1 and T1, if you like, at the inlet, or PI, TI, whichever you want to use. The exhaust pressure from the turbine is 6 bar, this is P2, and this is T2. So you can see temperature has dropped, and the pressure has dropped significantly as well, which is the case in turbines. Calculate the power output of the turbine if the mass flow rate is 100, m dot is 100 kilogram per second, and the inlet and outlet velocities are equal. Now, the fact that it says the inlet and outlet velocities are equal, then it suggests that the assumption that we had with um, ignoring, the, um, ignoring the kinetic energy and the, and the potential energy is, is valid, and therefore we, we only have to deal with the simple equation uh, that we saw earlier here, this one. But because it talks about power, so you want to find the power output, and this essentially represents W dot. So you need to find an equation for W dot, which isn't going to be that difficult. Uh, it's just going to be an inclusion of the mass flow rate in the equation. Now, what seems to be missing again is just the entropy values uh, at point one and point two, inlet and outlet. And of course, because you're dealing with steam, you have to go to the steam table. When you go to the steam table, and because this is a superheated steam, then you go to page seven in this case. You can see that superheated steam starts from page six, and it goes all the way to page um, to page 9 and the reason is because you've got a range of pressures uh, and temperatures really so um, what we are after is so the first thing is we want to find uh, at 100 bar and 600 Celsius so if you actually go to page 8 for the first case so if, you, if I go to page 8 I've got the, uh, the pressure which is 100 bar, and you read off the temperature, which is 600 Celsius, and from, from that point, I need to find what is the entropy. And the entropy which you will find will be in, in this point, but essentially what, you, what you're after, these values that you have, um, sorry, it's actually here, 3624, Again, pay attention to what you see here because this is entropy H, this, this row is H, this row, for example, is the specific volume, but then with this conversion factor, and this line is entropy. So it's sort of similar to what you've been doing for the, um, uh, the two-phase flow, um, what I mean by two-phase flow, I'm, talk I'm talking about saturated water steam on the previous pages. It's the sort of similar values that you will be reading off. And there's one column here that will give you the saturated, or essentially the, the values of H and V and S with subscript G, which refers to the dry saturated area. 
Anyway, for this case, that's a number that I want, 3624. And for case 2, because the pressure is lower, I need to go to page 7. Pressure now is 6 bar and 200 Celsius. So it's 6 bar here, 200 Celsius. And I want to get the value of, of enthalpy. And that is 2851. So I got those two values from the steam table. So you know where these values now come from. And as I said, because you've got, um, you want the power output, you want to use the W dot equation, which brings M dot in the equation. And by doing that, you get your value, which is going to be actually positive. And it's in watts again. Um, because the value is so large, we change it to megawatts. But again, because the value is positive, then you see that this is um, the work is done by the fluid. And therefore, again, turbine being a, uh, a power producing machine. Don't be confused with the negative sign here. Uh, the negative sign here is just because we've just swapped H1 and H2. So it's not a a new equation is exactly the same equation on the previous page. On the previous page, we had H1 minus H2. Here we have H2 minus H1. So we just, you know, essentially multiplied both sides by minus 1. Any questions so far? Okay. Now, now, that brings us to our fourth adiabatic machine. Throttle, um, or sometimes actually we, I would, I would say actually this is the same as a valve. This has a lot of applications as well, actually. Um, you might come across, um, you've seen valves in lots of situations. It could be, for example, in a type of a stopcock sort of um, valve in a, in a water main. You've seen that. In um, coming back to the thermodynamic examples, actually, of, of the throttle or valve, in most of the refrigerant uh, cycles, you have a valve. And it does actually a lot of interesting stuff. What it does, it, it brings the fluid from a high pressure to a lower pressure within a very short amount of time. And as soon as the flow goes through the valve, it suddenly loses the pressure. And that is a very attractive feature. Because if you lose the pressure, then when it comes to the cycles, thermodynamic cycles, that's quite attractive for us. Because if you think about a, a PV diagram, and when, we co when it comes to cycles, we'll be showing these cycles in a PV diagram, TS diagram all the time. That means that, for example, if you have a cycle which goes like this, when you get to that point, and if you want to go to this point, imagine you want to bring your cycle down from point two to three, then you could potentially introduce a valve in that point and then suddenly bring <coughs> the pressure down. Um, and that is what, for example, a valve can do. It's the same with the throttle. Um, and that, symbol, that sort of symbol or schematic is how we show it. Try to get used to these um, schematics, the same for turbines and compressors, because in a lot of situations, we might give you a diagram with some of these, these representations. And essentially, you have to know that this is a uh, turbine, this is a compressor, um, and so on. Now, the other sort of example of, of a valve is the orifice plate. Orifice um, plates are commonly used in flow meters. You've seen, for example, um, a gauge maybe on, on a pipe system, and that pipe system measures, gives you the velocity or the pressure, mainly for the velocity meters or flow meters 
you would use an orifice in order to measure the, uh, the velocity. And that is actually based on the same concept of, of throttling process. <coughs> but what I wanted to really take away from, from this, uh, you know, for you guys, is the fact that when we have a working fluid, uh, which is a pure substance, then the sharp pressure drop, which you get naturally, um, physically, in, in a valve, will actually result in a sharp temperature drop as well. And that is, again, quite attractive for us because by this simple design, you can change the temp temperature and pressure very suddenly. Okay, now what about the equations? Starting with the steady flow energy equation, which you can see here, we have all the elements uh, that we, we, we normally have. The first thing you realize is that there's not gonna be any shaft in a valve, you do not have any shaft work, therefore WS is going to be zero. Um, we're also going to assume that this is adiabatic. Um, so there's not going to be any losses of heat. That's different from the change of temperature. We're talking about losing heat from the system. Now, the change in the potential energy is actually going to be zero because Basically, if you think about point one and point two, the main thing here is Z2 and Z1, and these represent the, uh, these represent the, the elevation of the point, and you're not gonna be at different elevations at different points, therefore the potential energy gain or loss is gonna be essentially zero. As a result, that disappears. This time, you can't ignore the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is actually quite important because the whole function, which what I mentioned about losing the pressure and the temperature is, is because of the change of velocity. And therefore that term is no longer insignificant. So what happens now? You're left with this term and this term. If you decide, you can, you can swap and you can change and bring the terms with subscript two to the left-hand side and keep the ones with subscript one to the right-hand side, which you end up with this equation. And in fact, the enthalpy plus the kinetic energy would give us something interesting, what we call the stagnation enthalpy, which is known as H0. Just gonna get rid of the microphone, I don't think this is actually run out of battery, so this is okay. Um, now we'll, we'll see actually the one application of, of uh, the uh, stagnation entropy, but the meaning of the stagnation entropy is, in fact, as, as the name suggests, is that is the value of entropy if you bring the fluid to a sudden stop or to a su sudden um, rest. So I know physically sometimes it actually is it's difficult to do that. But for example, if I have a flow in a, in a tunnel, whatever the velocity is, if I suddenly introduce a plate to, to bring the flow to a complete stop, so I seal that the flow at that point, if I had some sort of measurement or sort of, sort of sensor or something that could measure the amount of velocity or pressure that would be hitting this, this plate, that would es essentially give you the value of the stagnation entropy. So in a local situation, in reality, you can't do that. You don't suddenly, suddenly bring the flow to a sudden stop. But if you were to do that, then you could actually measure what is the stagnation entropy. You'll see actually why it's important. But for now, um, let's just um, look at some of the assumptions um, that is actually applicable to uh, to, to valves, which would actually result in even further simplification in, um, in, the, in the valve. Now, in some situations, when it comes to the throttle, um, the velocity, depending on the design and situation, but the velocity actually could, the change in velocity could be insignificant. And that is actually, in, in, it's not as common, but in some situations, the velocity doesn't change much. And if that happens, then as a result, you can assume that that term and that term will be equal to each other. And what you're left 
with is just a simple equation of H2 equals H1. So and that's the only equation which is applicable to a valve if the change in velocity can be ignored. Now, in this box here, I've got two um, assumptions or two scenarios, if you like. Any problem dealing with valves and throttles will be either one of these scenarios. And depending on which scenario you have, you'll have a different type of equation applicable. Scenario one is when the change in velocity across a throttle is not negligible. Then the stagnation entropy across the valve is constant. It means that if V1 is not equal to V2, what happens is H01 will be equal to H02. So the stagnation entropy at point one will be equal to the stagnation entropy at point two. In the second scenario, when the change in flow, in flow velocity across the valve is negligible, then the static entropy is conserved. And this is the case where we had H1 equal to H2. That's the one which I said is probably less common, but you'll, you'll actually see one example in here. This is actually an example for the second scenario. And I think let's do this and then it, it might uh, make more sense. So, steam flows through a throttle valve. The pressure upstream of the valve is five bar and the fluid is dry saturated. So again, remember, dry saturated, which means X is equal to one. If the pressure drop across the valve is four bar, so you're gonna lose four bar, therefore P2 will be one bar. Calculate the temperature of the steam downstream of the valve. You, you may assume that the effects of velocity may be negligible. And the fact that it says the effects of velocity, you could ignore them, that suggests that you are dealing with the second scenario. Now, what we know is that in this situation, entropy across the valve is going to be the same. Now, I want to highlight something quite important here. I want, in order to, for you to understand what is happening in this problem, I'm going to draw a diagram which we haven't done actually in the past. This is not a very conventional diagram. This is pressure versus entropy. We've done pressure um, PV and, T and TV diagrams. PH is not a very conventional diagram. We're, gonna, we're not going to be dealing with that, but I want you to have an imagination because this actually makes sense when it comes to this problem. Now, if you search for a diagram for a pH diagram for, for a pure substance or, for example, for steam, it, this is a sort of diagram that it looks like. So as opposed to having that sort of uniform shape, what we normally have for PV diagram, instead of having that sort of shape, this is sort of a more of a skewed um, area. But the same points really apply. So here you're going to have the critical point. This line represents the dry saturated line, dry uh, steam saturated line, and this is the, the dry fluid, uh, sorry, the, this is the, the fluid saturated line. So underneath this curve, you're going to have the two-phase flow where you have the steam and water. Here you're going to have the superheated, and here you're going to have the liquid, or the water, when you're talking about H2O. The sort of situations that we have here is that I have a point, let's say here, this is my point one, and it refers to five bar, okay? So that's point one. Because I know that the effects of velocities can be ignored, I know that H1 will be equal to H2. 
so, and I know that the pressure has dropped to one bar. So if one bar is, let's say here, this is not to scale, so this is just to show you a schematic. Then surely the sort of line line that we'll be looking at here will be a com a completely vertical line, and therefore point two should be here. So this should be state two. This should be state one. Now the question might be: Why did I put the first state on this curve? Well, because the the flow the, the question actually states that. At the inlet, the fluid is dry saturated, so I know it's going to be on this curve somewhere. So when I want to find the value on the, on the steam table, I'm going to be looking at HG. Remember, anything on this curve would have the subscript G, which stands for the uh, for gas, and this is a dry saturated gas. Um, and the second point about this diagram is that because entropy has not changed, but only the pressure has dropped, it, mean, it means that now, after the valve, your flow or your steam is not going to be dry saturated anymore. It's actually going to be superheated because it has now, now moved out of this curve, even not on the boundary anymore, and it has moved to the right-hand side of, of the curve. So that area, that shaded area, um, Let's just do that. That shaded area here represents the superheated region. So physically, what I know is that my flow has now changed state uh, in terms of you know the actual um, physical um, properties. Um, it has changed from a dry saturated to a superheated steam now. Now it's time to go to the steam table and find the properties um, on page four. Again, I've, I've gone back to the saturated water and steam table because uh, I'm now dealing with a dry saturated case. The pressure is five bar. Uh, and so one, um, so the, what, what we want is a H, HG in this point. And if you do not have the, the pressure of, um, so what, what I'm looking for here is five bar on, on this table, and you can see here I've got five bar here. If I now draw a line and see where I end up, I want to look at this value. This is what I want. This is HG for pressure at five bar, and that would be my H1. Exactly for the same read reason why I said you're now moving to the superheated region, I can't now go and say, well, in the state two, pressure is one bar, so I'm just going to read off this value, 2675. Well, that's not going to be true because that value would have been a point at this, at this location. So I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in this one. And therefore, I need to go to page... Um, so what, what happens really is that that value would be, the value which you, you've got from, from here, 2675, I can record that, but that's going to be HG. And that is this value here. Actually, this, this should have been 2675, as you just saw. doesn't really matter. Um, I think the reason why this 6 is because of the, uh, the round, round up error. Uh, some steam tables, that is 2676. Um, Anyway, 2675, that's HG2. Now, because I have H2 equal H1, and because I mentioned that now you've moved to um, superheated region, now you've got to go to page 6, which is the superheated, and look for... The reason why I'm, I'm looking at this now is because I'm after the temperature. The question is asking you what is the temperature in state two. My H, I know, is going to be between what I had here and what I had here. 
okay? And I know h at point two will be equal to, at, uh, to h at point one, and I put a uh, diagram in your, in your notes here. I've taken, this is actually easy to show. I've taken these values from the steam table at pressure one bar. You can look at that from in your own time from the steam table. At point uh, P equals one bar, I've got two values of H at temperature 100 and 150. And at this point, I need to do some interpolation because I know my temperature is going to be somewhere between 100 and 150, but I don't know what is this value. <coughs> what is this temperature here? What I know is that the, my value of H, in fact, is 2749, which is, in fact, equal to H1. And as I mentioned, you can do interpolation because you know the value of entropy, and you can do the interpolation between 100 and 150. And by doing that, you end up with 136.1 Celsius. I was hoping to finish um, the nozzles as well, uh, but unfortunately I don't have time for that. So what we're going to do on Monday, uh, I will be going through the nozzle. We're going to spend about 10 minutes to finish this off, and then we're going to move on to the, uh, the next chapter. By the way, we're not going to be do doing anything on, heat on the heat exchanger. So you can see in your notes that we've got some heat exchangers and some analysis on that. Because you're going to be doing a lot of heat exchangers in the future, um, we're not going to redo really that at this point. Therefore, that's again optional. But I'll come back and I, I, I'll confirm that next time on Monday. But the only device which we're going to go through will be the nozzle, which is going to be on Monday. Any questions before we stop? Okay, good. <laughs>